John chapter number 4. We're going to start reading in verse number 31. The Bible says, In the mean, while his disciples prayed him, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore his disciples one to, said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look into the fields. They are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathering fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestow no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Now, in this passage, John chapter number 4, everybody thinks of woman at the well. That happened just prior to this. Okay, in fact, in verse number 29, she ran into the city saying, come and see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? Okay, then it says in verse number 30, then they went out of the city and came unto him. Who's them? That's the Samaritans. Came out to believe on. Verse number 31 says, in the meanwhile, so this has happened between the woman at the well headed back to the city to tell everybody and everybody in the city coming out to see Christ. Okay, so it's in the meantime. The disciples sit there. They say, well, she ran away. No guarantee that anybody was going to come out. Jesus knew that they would, but the disciples are saying, well, we got a little break here. Lord, eat something. They said, no, I'm not hungry. He says, I've got meat that you don't know about. Then he goes on to several very important first fields of white under harvest. Right? He said, look up, not four months to harvest, not, you know, well, now it is autumn. In my mind, we're still back in March before COVID hit. But anyway, it's October, almost November. This is while we're on it. Mom asked me the other night, hey, you want to sit down and watch a Christmas movie? It's not even Halloween yet. How far are they pushing this thing up every year? They keep making movies every year. None of them are good. Just stick to the classics, and then you can watch them Christmas time. You're good. And throw an elf, because that's a classic. But anyway. Not we've got until then. I guarantee you this. You start waiting until about, I don't know, December 20th to go Christmas shopping. It's going to be too late. Or you're going to have to order everything off Amazon and then pay for next day shipping, which is going to cost you just as much whatever you want to buy. Right? That's called procrastination. I've learned that lesson a few times. <clears throat> but anyway... Point being, Jesus says, plenty of labor to do. Now we as Christians, we know. We hear it every Sunday. There's a lot to do. In fact, we look at the field, sometimes it's white under harvest, and we think there's no way we can get that done. You're right, you can't do it. But Christ can. Right? It is not your job to go out and clear the whole field. Jesus said in verse number 36, he that reapeth, receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal that he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together then in verse number 38 he tells the disciples I sent you to reap that whereupon ye bestowed no labor okay the guy that does the reaping doesn't have the same skills as the side of guy that puts the seeds in the ground okay the guy that goes and plants doesn't have the same skills as the guy that went and plowed the field okay there are specialization so to speak nowadays they got a combine that'll do about anything that you want to do one guy can drive it but back in the day if one group was reaping this field sowers were over in the other field right they got paid for sowing and then the reapers got paid for reaping but both of them rejoiced together okay, they each understood that's not my job this is all I can do and there wasn't only one person that went out to, to Reap. Go read the story about Ruth and Boaz. Right? There were many that worked his fields that were going out. They did so much reaping that they had to throw it up into carts. Right? They weren't just going out and picking and sticking it in a basket and heading to the house. Right? This was a large operation. And one man knew, I don't have to clear the whole field. I've just got to clear what I've got to clear. Right? It's a daunting task when you start thinking about everybody that's not saved everybody that's not right with God everybody that's wayward or a prodigal right and you think there's no way I can't you're right don't think that way 
Right? Jesus did not say my meat is to do the will of God for everybody else. Okay? Jesus did not come, die on the cross, get up again, and then stay and preach. In fact, he said that it's better that he would go to heaven and that the Comforter might come. That we could have the Holy Ghost living and dwelling inside of us. Right? Christ did what God wanted him to do, and then he was done. Right? Paul knew he didn't have to go to every country and start a church. Right? The Apostle Paul went many places. I mean, you study out of the guy got a lot of traveling done. And he did a lot of it by foot. Right? But in all of his journeys, he never, I mean, we can find that there are many places that he desired to go. But God wouldn't let him go, so he didn't go. He went where God wanted him to go. He started churches wherever God would allow him to start a church. If he went somewhere, I mean, Philippi, if he went and he preached, then he got thrown in jail. He could have thrown his hands up and said, well, Lord, I went and I preached. But if he'd have given up there, the church of Philippi never would have been started. Because it started in that Philippian jailer's house. He and his whole house got saved. Right then, the Apostle Paul moved on. He kept sending preachers, by the way. Right after he instilled in them the doctrine of Christ, he moved on because he understood, I've, I can't stay here. The Lord doesn't want me to stay here until this land. I've planted the seed. It's time to go and plant somewhere else. He didn't get to go all over the creation and plant a church in every city. But the Lord, through His divine omniscience, knew because a few churches started. Those churches planted other churches. And those, plant, those planted others and others and others. And eventually we find that we got one here in Florence, Kentucky. The Apostle Paul didn't start this church, but it's because of the seeds that he planted that it eventually got to us. He understood. He didn't have to do it. He just had to do what God wanted him to do. That very important. I mean, when he sent the disciples out two by two, these two didn't have to worry about doing the job of these two. They had to worry about doing their job. Right? What was their job? To prepare the way of the Lord. To announce that Christ had come. Right? And he didn't send them to the same cities. It said that he sent them throughout all. Once they told this city, they had to go to the next city. Right? The fields were white, but they each had their own section. Right? It's, very easy to be, it's very easy to let the devil tell you and to believe that you're not going to make a difference. Hogwash. I'm not doing nothing. Christ is doing it. He's just using me to do it. Right? The plow doesn't actually plow the field. It's the oxen that are pulling it. I'm just the plow. He's the one pulling. Right? I'm just the hammer. He's the one driving. Right? But he's got the balm of Gilead. You may be the bandage that he uses to apply the balm of Gilead. We're not the one doing the work. We're just being obedient to what he said. But we're not going to talk about any of that. But that's what he's talking about. What caught my attention in verse number 34, he said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Now see, I can't finish the work of God. The work of God will go on long after I'm off the earth or when we get to heaven. God still got stuff to do. Read the back of the book. Tribulation period, millennial reign. There's a whole lot left that he's got to do. And I'm not... I mean, we'll be given positions in the millennial reign, but still, I'm just doing what he wants me to do. He's the one that's still in charge. I can't finish the work, but like the Apostle Paul said, I can finish my course. I can't finish what God has given me to do. But he says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. See, verse number 31, the disciples said, they prayed him, they're begging him. They know it's been a while since he's eaten. And they're begging him, Lord, we know you don't stop much. Right? You're always busy. We go off to sleep somewhere. You're up praying all night. Right? We know that even when we do find a place and you lay your head down to sleep, most of the time you've got a rock for your pillow. So while you've got a minute, eat. We're out here in the middle of the day. I mean, go back woman at the well had to go out and draw her water in the middle of the day because she was ostracized by the other women for her lifestyle. 
She couldn't go in the early morning before the sun came up when the water was cold in the well. She had to go out when the sun was hot and the water was hot because she wasn't allowed to go with the other women because she had made a disgrace of her life to the rest of the, you know, to the rest of the people in the city. So it's the middle of the day. It's hot day in the desert. Right? I mean, you go back to the beginning of chapter number 4. He left and he said, and he must needs go through Samaria. The disciples are saying, nobody goes to Samaria, Lord. That's like, nowadays, if you say, I've got to go to downtown Chicago. You don't want to go to downtown Chicago. Chicago's got more murders every year than anywhere else in the U.S. Right? You, you don't want to go down there. Or, even worse off, you know, I'm going to go to that Chaz zone over there in the liberal states, right, where they kicked all the police and all the government out. You don't want to go down there. That's anarchy. But Jesus said, no, I got to go to the worst of the worst. Must needs to go through Samaria. So they're going the long way around anyway. The longest possible route that he could have taken to get to where they were going. And Samaria was the middle. So they've already journeyed long. Then it's the middle of the day. They're starving. They're saying, Lord, we've got food. Eat. He says, I've got meat. I've got something to satisfy me. He says, my meat is to do the will of the Father. But he told them that he had meat that they didn't know about. Keep in mind, we're only in chapter number 4 of the book of John. Still relatively early on in Christ's ministry, earthly ministry. Right? This isn't Peter and John of first and second Peter, first and second, third John, book of Revelation. Right? They're still young in their faith. Right? They've still got mistakes to make. They've still got decisions that maybe they wish that they could take back to make. They're still thinking carnally. They're saying, Lord, it's hot out here. You drug us out here in the middle of nowhere. Can we stop and have a meal? Because if the master doesn't eat, nobody else eats. They're saying, can you please sit down and have a meal so we can eat with you? And that's what they're saying. And Jesus says, I'm not thinking about food. I've got meat. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. So first what he's saying is, I do not crave what this world craves. Right, let's be honest. How many of us, truly, if, if you're like me, and you've got a one-track mind, and you don't like changes to schedules, right, if I've got it made up that I'm going to do X, Y, and Z in that order, nothing's going to change it, and come hell or high water, it's going to get done by the end of the day. What if God throws a wrench in your plans? Would we say, no, 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 my me, it's not to go through the Skyline drive through right now because God's given me an opportunity to witness to somebody. He's waiting on them to come out of the city. The disciples think, well, he's not doing anything anyway right now. But he's patiently waiting for the one that he sent to bring the rest of them out. And Jesus didn't tell her to go get the whole city. She just ran and told them all. She kind of got like Brother Amos back in camp meeting or revival, whatever we, whatever it was. Right? I was listening to the song today in the car, but Daniel up here singing about blind Bartimaeus. Right? You, Master touch you, you feel a little bit of the power that he's got, right? You're going to start running laps and running back to town and telling everybody else who you met. I mean, and then the chorus of that song, Jesus, the living Savior, King of glory, thou son of David, you're just going to go tell him, hey, I met the Christ. You get foot. She didn't even know what the will of God really was for her life, but she said, I got to go tell everybody else. They need what I just found. She got a drink of that living water, and she wanted everybody else to get a drink too. She went to go do the will of the Father. The disciples don't know that anybody's coming out. They said, Lord, we've come all the way out here. You talked to that half breed woman, which is what Samaritans were. Can we eat now? They said, No, you about ready to get full. You don't realize it yet, but you're about ready to see something that's a shock. He went into his own and his own received him not, so he must needs go through Samaria. 
Right, by the way, that's us too, because we had no claim to God. All they're thinking with is their stomach. Sometimes all we think with is our wallet or our stomach or the television remote or your cell phone. Right? Or you're thinking about tomorrow. Now give no thought for tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. We're promised now. He's saying, y'all are thinking about how hungry you are. If you thought about how spiritually hungry those people were, you wouldn't be so hungry right now. But are we perfectly okay with showing up a little late to dinner if it means that I got to witness to the lady across the counter at the gas station? Or are we so dead set on keeping our schedule that we don't even notice the doors that God may be opening around us? When he says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me, what he's saying is, I crave that which the Lord wants me to do. The most satisfying thing to me is to do the will of the Father. The most satisfying thing that I can do is to finish that which I came to start. And really, it was started back before the foundation of the earth. He was, he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He's saying, everything's coming to a head, and the thing that satisfies me right now eating a little bit of fish, eating a little bit of bread, eating a little bit of meat. It's to see those people put their faith in the one that God said is our only way to glory. He's the way, the truth, and the life. But see, they didn't see that. They missed it. Why? Because their spirituality was hindered by their current physical position. They's out in the middle of nowhere. They are starving. Well, they weren't starving, but they were hungry. And they say, Lord, can we eat now? Will you please sit down and have a meal? He says, we'll get to the food later. we got business to do. And why did Christ do what he did? Is out of love. When you're doing something because of love, it doesn't really matter how hungry you are because you had to go run an errand on your lunch break. And you may run out of time and all you got was to get something off of the dollar menu at McDonald's. Right? Because the line at Chick-fil-A was about eight miles long, which it always is at lunchtime. Right? So you didn't get what you want. You had to settle. But if you were running to get a grandbaby a Christmas present, hunger don't bother you. It was a labor of love. Right? If you was trying to surprise your wife with something, and you went out and you even got cash out of the ATM so she couldn't find out about it ahead of time on the credit card or the checking card report at the end of each month. Right? You was doing your best, but you missed lunch that day. You wouldn't be that hungry. Because you were doing something for somebody that you loved. Right? Things that used to, you may even say, I'd never do that. When you love somebody, you do things that you didn't used to. Even entertain things that you wouldn't have even thought about now because you love them you think about those things Christ is saying because I love the Father going hungry for a little bit isn't too big of a problem and let's be honest we could all probably miss more than a few meals and still be okay right but that's just the context he's talking about here how many grandparents out there retired don't need to work they're good but they'll go out and they'll be a greeter at Walmart and get cussed out by people coming in the door because they want them, you know, put on a mask. But they're doing it so that they've got a little bit of extra change at the end of the year or throughout the year to get birthday presents or Christmas presents. Right? They deal with all the nastiness and they don't consider it a burden because the entire time they're thinking about, yeah, but I'll get to get Johnny or Susie this. Right? I'm not here for me. I'm here for somebody else and that means I can handle it. I mean, in fact, Dr. Sheila's got a patient. He's retired, and he's gotten bored. And he started making wooden piggy banks shaped like animals. And not just pigs, but, I mean, he's got elephants and rhinos and frogs and bees and a whole bunch of other stuff. But all the money that he's getting off of those, he's just putting it into the grandkids' college fund. Well, you say it's not much. No, but he's doing it out of a labor of love. Actually, he sold quite a few of them. If he keeps this up, there might be a lot in there. But it's just something he wants to do out of love. It's all the splinters that he gets. All the times that he's you know, trying to put that jig on there for 
the uh, the router and he's putting them boards around there. If he chips a fingernail, he's not worried about it because he's doing it out of love for them youngins. Right? Well, Christ is saying, if your heart's right, them things that keep jumping up, things that take most of our attention, our focus will shift off of those things and they won't be as important anymore. But also, when he says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. Keep in mind, Jesus didn't go up to the woman at the well and the Samaritans start the conversation. Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. Samaritans knew that. Samaritans knew he won't talk to us, so I shouldn't talk to him. If Jesus sat down and had a meal outside of the city, when everybody came out, nobody would have talked to him. He had to be the one to start the conversation. If he would have sat down with his disciples and started eating, when the rest of the city came out, they would have just seen somebody that was not going to come into their city because it was a place of the Gentile, a place of the unclean. Jesus did everything according to the law. He wouldn't go into Samaria. But when they came out to see Him, He received them. If He didn't start the conversation, the conversation wouldn't have happened. The woman could have came back and said, that's Him. But everybody else in the city wouldn't have gone up and said, excuse me, are you the Christ? Because of the protocol of the day, the social norms, they'd have been too afraid to approach because we don't have anything to do with Jews. You didn't tell us he was Jewish. You just said he was the Christ. So many times we think, well, I'll just go ahead and do it, and if something comes up, I'll stop what I'm doing and handle it. If Jesus would have sat down and had a meal, when they showed up, they would have thought he cares more about food than he does everybody in this town. If he wouldn't have been standing there waiting to receive them, they'd have thought, well, he's writ the rest of us off. He would do it for the worst of the worst, but he wouldn't do it for us. He gave her a drink of living water. Well, how many people in today's world could we reach if instead of having the mindset, Lord, I'm just going to sit down and deal with what I'm going to do, and if you open the door... I'm going to do it. But the person that needs help just walks right on by because they think, oh, that person's busy. He don't have time for me. That person doesn't care about me. If they don't even care enough to pay attention when I come walking in the room, they don't really care about me. Jesus is saying, my meat, the thing that's most important to me right now, you're hungry. Christ is probably hungry too. We know that He used His body in a whole lot different way than we did. In three and a half years, he did much praying. He did much fasting. I mean, he fasted 40 days in the wilderness. I mean, if God told me to, I would, but Lord, don't sign me up for that. That's a long time. I know Elijah had a meal, and it lasted him for 40 days, but, I mean, I've had some good meals. In fact, I had steak in Omaha one time. I wasn't hungry for two days. But I got hungry on the third day. It didn't last me 40. But, so often we're like, well, Lord, if I don't get this errand done, it's not going to get done. So we rush out the door right as somebody else was coming in. Oh, hey, I'll be right back. And they think that person didn't have any. They said that I could talk to them. They said that I could ask them questions. But when I came in to ask them, they didn't have time that day. What Jesus is telling the disciples is, what you think is most important right now is a deterrent to what God wants to do. Just because you're willing to do it doesn't mean that it's going to get done. Sometimes we have to set aside the things that we think are important to be there to receive those that want to know more about Christ. Not enough to put a sign out on the yard, hey, if you've got questions about Jesus, come on in. Right? Jesus didn't say, well, I'm going to head to the next town over. Y'all come and get me. He stood there waiting for them to come back. 
what the disciples thought was an inconvenience was actually in the perfect will of God. How many people in the world are going to come to God's people on their own, tap them on the shoulder and say, excuse me, can you tell me about Jesus? How many people in the world are going to come up and say, hey, what makes you different? Right? Jesus started the conversation with the woman at the well. He also had to be waiting to receive the Mass. Because if He wouldn't have started that conversation, they wouldn't have started it. If God opens the door, it's not enough to expect somebody to walk through it. Sometimes you've got to walk through the door to go talk to somebody. Sometimes you've got to, by faith, say, you know what, Lord, I don't know why you want me to stay you know, here today, don't know why you want me to go over here, but everything I got planned, that's fine. I'm going to sit here and wait until whatever you said or whatever you told me to wait on happens. He said that his meat was to do the will of the Father. Sometimes we think that being in the will of God is just being where we're supposed to be. Well, you can be in the house of God, doesn't mean you're going to do business with God. You can go out handing out tracks and knocking on doors. But if you cared, would you season them with prayer beforehand? If somebody was out on their yard mowing the grass, well, I don't want to inconvenience them. Well, it doesn't have to be something profound. And say, hey, uh, like Peter on the day of Pentecost, I'm going to preach for a few hours to you. No, it might just be as simple as a wave and saying, hey, don't want to bother you, but... We're from Emmanuel Baptist Church. I'm just going to leave some stuff on your front door now. That may be all that it takes. All that Jesus asked was for her to draw out water for him to get a drink. She said the rest. She said, what do you, being a Jew, have... You know, why are you asking me, a Samaritan? You guys don't have anything to do with us. And really, he didn't want the water. He wanted her to start thinking about that water that gives everlasting life. Right? The conversation started that you said just being polite, just being cordial, just letting somebody know that you care may be all that it takes for them to say, hey, I was thinking, by the way. Because let's be honest, the Holy Ghost is a whole lot better at doing what God wants done than we are. If we yield and just say, all right, Lord, I'll talk to him. All right, Lord, I'll go. All right, Lord, I'll wait. It may just be a, hey, how you doing today? I'm doing good. Hey, you remember that one time you said this? No, but sounds like something I'd say. And that may be the entire conversation starter. It's not up to me to figure out how the whole field's going to get harvested. Well, Lord, there's a lot to do. i got to go do this. i got to do, do that. Well, the Lord said, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, as we heard preached on by our pastor, and all these things will be added unto you. What were the disciples concerned about? Meat. Well, he said having food and raiment be content therewith but he also said as our pastor preached that if you seek the kingdom of God God knows what you have need of he'll provide it maybe they wanted to sit down and make the meal right? well maybe if you just do the will of God you'll find that the meal is already prepared when you get done right? it never ceases to amaze me if you just yield what may in the flesh seem like an inconvenience if you do what God wants you to do, whatever you needed to get done, it's going to still get done. And it's probably going to be less of a headache too. Right? Maybe the person behind you in line, the Lord, I don't want to talk to them. I want to get out of this line as quickly as possible. Well, maybe if you just talk to them, the lady at the register would be able to ring out that you know, person that's got 900 coupons in front of you. Maybe it'll just go a whole lot quicker if you just did the will of God. Right? Maybe they won't have to call the manager on every other coupon to say, hey, is this thing still valid? Hey, can I get a price check on this? You're saying, that's silly. No, I'm just saying that if you do what God said, He'll take care of the rest. When we are satisfied with doing the will of the Father, He'll satisfy all the needs. They said, we're hungry, so we know that you're hungry. Jesus is saying, how do y'all know I'm not just going to go and like He did when they were out fishing? After he'd been crucified, he had resurrected. They're out on the boat. Peter's out there in his underwear. And then Jesus says, hey, how's the fishing? They said, it's the Lord. He jumped in the water. They get back to shore. They just caught a whole bunch of fish. Jesus already got some on the rocks cooking. 
How do you know that if you just do the will of God, He's already got it all prepared and waiting on you? But we miss out on that if we say, no, I'm not going to receive them. No, I'm not going to be waiting on them. No, I'm not going to be the one to start the conversation. Right? How silly would it be talking about harvesters and reapers? If you went through all the trouble of getting all the seed, tilling all the ground, and then you went out to start planting and you said, well, I don't know which spot's the best. I don't know if the seed's going to grow in that spot. And then you get caught up on trying to find the perfect spot to put a seed. Well, Jesus in his parable of the sower said some found good ground, but some found thorny ground, some found rocky ground. But they just cast the seed. And wherever God let it grow, that's where it grew. Instead of worrying about where to put the seed, maybe you just pray, Lord, this may not be the best ground in the world, but I'm still going to put seed there because you told me to. Lord, I pray you'd send rain. I pray that you'd send sunlight. And this thing could grow up in good ground. Even though the world would say, nah, that ground can't grow nothing. I pray that you'd just let something grow. I guarantee you the people that went out and spread seed reaped a whole lot more than the people trying to find the perfect ground to plant in. I guarantee you the people that go out and they plant, by the entire time that they're planting, they're saying, Lord, I know that it can rain like a monsoon, but if, unless it's your will, this seed isn't going to grow. There can be all the sunshine from here until harvest time that this plant needs, but unless you want it to grow, it's not going to grow. So Lord, by faith, I'm putting this in the ground and just, just believe it. You're going to do the rest. Right? You may not understand why you got, you know, Holy Ghost just tug on your heart and say, hey, give that person a track. Lord, I don't know them. Well, you just may be the water today. You didn't do the planting, but you may do some watering. Eventually, God's going to give the increase. Did He not say that the sowers and the reapers rejoice together? You may not be the one that pulls it up out of the ground, but if you did some labor along the way because God told you to do it, it may have just been some watering, may have been some pruning, may have just been making up the hedge, standing in the gap so that the foxes can't get in and spoil the vines. All of us rejoice together on the other side. When it comes in, everybody gets to be partaker of the fruit. And really, what is the fruit while we're here? Jesus said, I'm the true vine. Everything that we do is just Jesus. Right? It's the gospel going out and Jesus doing in somebody else's life what they couldn't do for themselves. And the fruit that comes up is because of Him. The fruit isn't what that person did or what you and I did. It's just God being good. Showing mercy. Giving somebody else salvation. Right? Restoring someone. Because they didn't have to. Didn't have to do any of it. I don't have to do anything. Right? God made us all free moral agents. I don't have to. God's not standing over me with a lightning bolt. But because I love Him, my meat is to do the will of Him that sent me. Because when you got saved, He sent you. He may have sent you to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, or the uttermost parts of the earth. But wherever He sent you, he sent you. And He didn't send you there just to be a knot on the log. He sent you there to be light and salt. Right? You could put a candlestick in a room, but unless you light it, it's not going to light it. Or shine, illuminate it. Right? You could take salt, put it in a salt shaker, but unless you put it on your food, it's not going to be savory. Looking at salt doesn't make food taste better. It's when the salt gets onto the food that it tastes better. Having salt in your garage doesn't de-ice your driveway. you got to go out and spread it. But we can have all the tools. We can have everything that we need. In fact, the Lord. I mean, in today's day and age, it's easier to serve the Lord than ever. We can go play, reach places without ever having to touch foot there. Right? You could talk to a family member that lives on the other side of the earth just like they're sitting across the room. Right? Friends that used to 
You know, maybe, I don't know, it's a hypothetical, but God gave me it, so we're going to say it. Maybe somebody used to was a companion in the Lord. Maybe they, their job moved. Maybe they got transplanted somebody, somewhere else. Maybe a family member was sick and they had to move in with them and take care of them. Maybe that person's in a desert place and God just wants you to be an encouragement to them. A card in the mail can do a whole lot more than you think. A phone call can be all, you know, good news from a far country. It may be what they need. That may be they, I mean, we've heard it, and some of y'all have experienced it, but not everywhere is like around here. And maybe they're in a place where they can't come to a church where, you know, it just feels like every service God's just dumping more and more out on us. Right? Maybe they're in a dry place. Well, maybe they just need a little bit of a drink and you may be the cup that God gives them to drink out of. But uh, i got to make a couple of phone calls today at work. I don't know how I'm going to be able to do it. Well, maybe on your lunch break, right, while you're stuffing your face with food, you also call them. Right? Maybe when you get home, right, instead of turning on and watching a Christmas movie in the middle of October, you give them a call. Shoot them a text. Right? Because sometimes, I don't know, if we all different, but if you like me, it's a whole lot easier to help somebody with their problem than to ask for help. Right? You feel like you would be a burden to the other person. You feel like, well, why would they even care about what I got going on? Right? Sometimes you have to be standing there waiting to receive them but also start the conversation. Jesus said, it's not my meat to be where God wants me to be. It's not my meat to go where God wants me to go or to be prepared to do what God wants me to do. It's to do what God wants me to do. Right? We fall into the trap so often of, well, they know. Well, maybe they do. But maybe even though they know, they think that they don't want to bother you with it. Right? If we didn't have, you know, Peter saying, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you, if it wasn't written down as a promise, right, that God does care about us, would we have believed it when we heard it? Right? The proof is right here. But we're written epistles known and read of all men. Every now and then, you got to remind people. Just say, hey, I do care about you. Even though you said it, maybe they won't believe it until you do it. That everything that Jesus said he would do, he did. How many times have we told people, I'll be praying for you only to forget? Sometimes we have to do before others will actually confide in us. That woman had a lot of questions, but she didn't ask them until the Lord started the conversation. She was thinking, and she was thinking, that's a Jewish boy sitting on the well. One, what's he doing down here? And two, why is he sitting at our well? Then he asked her for water, and she says, hang on a second, you're different than everybody else. Then she's got questions that didn't have anything to do with water. She says, you guys worship in the temple. We worship up on the mountain. What's right? Jesus told her, they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. She says, I don't know how to. He says, we can take care of that. She says, you get a drink of the water. He said, you get a drink of the water that I've got. You'll be worshiping just fine. She was. She went into town worshiping, telling people about what Christ did for her. Sometimes it's not that we're not willing to. We would all say, well, yeah, I would do. But would you do it? Not just when it's an inconvenience, but when everything else that you're focused on. Disciples, all they could think about was food. Right? There are days that the only thing I can think about is fixing this problem that came up. Right? Or handling this thing that reared its head. Right? Or calling, you know, for work, it's insurance company. I hate insurance companies. Well, I take that back. I hate some insurance companies. Some of them are good. In fact, Medicare, surprisingly easy to deal with. Not the, not the problem one. 
It's easy to call them. No, it's the other ones. Right? But if I've got to make one of them call, I hate it. Hate it. Because all I'm thinking while I'm sitting there on the phone is all the other stuff that I could be doing, but I have to wait on hold because the second I go to do something else, I'm going to miss them, pick up the phone and say hello, and then they're going to hang up because I wasn't there or I didn't hear them, and I'm going to have to do the whole thing all over again. Hate it. And what I really hate is when they say, oh, I'll transfer you, and then the line goes dead. Oh, I want to hurt people. <laughs> I really do. But see, if all I can think about is the problem or what I'm trying to handle, what if God says, hey, I can take care of that better than you can. You just focus on doing the will of you know, the one that sent you. The Father says, hey, I have... I know what you have need of. And I can do a whole lot better on convincing somebody to fix something instead of you staying on hold for about eight hours to find a person that you really needed to talk to. I mean, why do they have so many employees if none of them can help you? Right? Why does it take so long to get to the person? Why, this is what I called for. Why didn't I talk to you first? Right? That should be in your job description. They should know it is you. Right? It should be that in the directory. This problem, this person. But see, God can say, ah, I can fix it a whole lot better. Right, those people, I mean, people make mistakes. Every now and then you just got to call people and say, hey, is this the way it's supposed to be? God just has a way of making sure that they find a mistake before you even know about it. If you're concerned with doing the will of him that sent you. Right, them car tires are going to last a little bit longer. If you just do the will of him that sent you. Wash machines are not going to wear out as quick. Right? Refrigerator compressor is going to last long after that warranty. Or, if you do the will of the Father, maybe the guy that picks up the phone when you go to call on it is the one you actually need to talk to. You say, that's just foolish. It's happened too many times to be a coincidence. Right? We can go around the room and people just start talking about, I don't know how God did it, but He did it. Well, when you're concerned with doing the will of the Father, He knows what you have need of. He may just drop some handfuls on purpose. Just say, because they were obedient, I'm just going to do it for them. Because they love me enough to sit there and receive, but then also initiate the conversation. Jesus could have stood there and been quiet. None of them would have talked to him. I mean, Jesus told her everything she had done. But in the other way around, she knew. He knows everything. So he knew why they were coming out. He knew what they were going to say. He, you know, all things being said and done, it could the same thing could have played out. But unless Jesus, when they came out, if Jesus didn't say, "Hey, how you doing?" They still wouldn't have talked to him. He knew what they needed to be forgiven of. Knew why they were coming out to see him knew what they you know, desired in their heart because they, like her, they said, we don't know where to worship God. We really don't know what we're doing. He said, I can introduce you. Hi, it's me. But if he wasn't the start of the conversation, he was prepared. They were willing to come and listen. But if he wouldn't have, you know, yielded the flesh and all the desires of the thing that we have to deal with every day he overcame all of it and we are more than conquerors through him the arm of flesh will fail me but his strength never gives out if we put us on the back burner and Christ first things usually just sort themselves out and if they don't there's a reason for it maybe the lady that you called to talk to at the bank I mean I'm, the people at the bank that for work it's a little local thing over there everybody in there knows me by name I can't remember any of their names I'm bad at it there's about four of them that I've got down but now they've got new people and I don't know their names right now but every time, hey George it may just be well who's this person why am I talking to them today Lord why is this taking so long maybe it's just because the Lord wants you to start the conversation 
I don't need to know what they're going through, all that God's been dealing with them with. All I need to know is that, okay, Lord, I'll start the conversation. And isn't it, doesn't it always just work out when you do that? The question that they ask you is either something that the preacher just preached on or something that you read about in your daily devotion. No, no, that's a coincidence. No, God sent the water pot to do some water and when it needed it. God sent somebody by that would tell them that they'd pray for them and they could see in their eyes that they actually meant it. God sent somebody by that once said, hey, if you ever need anything, I'll help. But they're afraid to ask you because they don't want to seem needy. They don't want to seem like an inconvenience. Hey, how you doing? How's your sick relative doing? How's this going? How's that going? Christians ought to have a love one for another. But if we're Christ-like, we have a love for those that we don't know. That they don't, you know, they don't know God, they don't know us. But we have a love for them so much that we would put our desires on the back burner. Say, Lord, I know you can handle that better and I can handle it anyway. But you've given this to me to do now. So I'll do it with everything I've got. He said, my meat is to do the will of God. The things that are savory, the things that taste best are the things that I get to do for God. Things that satisfy the most are the things that I get to do for God. The things that I crave and want more of are things from God. And he told them, I've got meat that you don't know about. How many of us at one point tasted what that meat was, but nowadays we don't know any more about it? We can't remember the taste and how sweet it is to just serve. Right? The savor of service is that one day we'll get to rejoice with those that reaped, those that planted, and with the one that we love supremely in glory for all of eternity. Right? I mean, it said in verse number 36 that we gather fruit unto eternal life that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. You know what that's talking about? One of these days in glory, God's going to start handing out crowns and gold, silver, precious gems. And at one point, I don't know when it's going to be, but we're all going to take everything they get and give it back to him and worship him because he's the one that did all the work anyway. But that's going to be one. I, I, eternity's a long time. I don't know everything that God's got planned. Right? But I do know that day, that's going to be a good day. But it's going to be a whole lot better if instead of just a few, you've got much to lay down at his feet and say, I just loved you, still love you, and I don't deserve this, you do. How much will you be able to rejoice in that day? Will everybody else be saying, man, you're not going to believe how much God let come up and then God just sent me by to collect it. I don't know where it came from. I don't know who did the planting, who did the watering. But God sent me one day and there's just a field to do some harvesting. I don't want to be the one that says, well, yeah, I had a flower pot that I put some seeds in and then, you know, a little bit came up. No, I just went and did the will of the Father. You may be wondering why you're out there, Lord, why am I watering this whole field today? Why does it seem like everywhere that I go, nothing's growing? May not be due season. May not be time for that to come up. In fact, some corn, you've got to plant it in autumn so that it freezes over winter so that it'll start growing in the spring. Right? You've got to go out in the cold and plant, and you're thinking, Lord, this isn't going to grow. I'm not the keeper of the vineyard. I'm just the servant. Lord, you want me to go plant it in cold dirt? I'll go plant it in cold dirt. Right, you want me to you know, send me out there in the middle of winter, make sure that the ground's cold enough? I'll do it. But see, going out there, it's going to be a miserable time. But, you know, if it's really cold, it's like the winters that we've had the past couple of years, that's not going to be too bad. But if it's really cold, and the devil just sends a wind by your way that, you know, chaps everything that isn't covered, and you get back in, you're thinking, well, why in the world do I have to do that? In due season, it's going to be worth it. You don't know when you get to glory how many times just a word fitly spoken, the Lord's going to say, you did 
what I desired you to do. And that's enough. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. Do the will of Him that sent you. And if you do it out of love, it's the sweetest thing that you can ever taste. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.